So this presentation is Reaching the Fearful Dog, Behavior Intervention for the Shy and Fearful Dogs. So first, who are the fearful dogs? Um, fear isn't something that's just in a few dogs. All dogs and all people and all animals should have the ability to be fearful. But there's some dogs that we're finding in the shelters that are fearful to the point that you have to deal with it more than maybe 50% of the time. You have to work through it with that dog. Um, but it can also be dogs that we kind of label as anxious and we'll kind of go over why anxiety and fear have two different sources and two different ways of interfering with the dog's ability to adjust to a home. We're going to look at how to make a home safe for those dogs and then training and your relationship and things that you can do behaviorally for those dogs to make life a little easier. So what is a fearful dog? Um, here is a little pointer who came in. This dog was from a puppy mill. Um, here are some dogs from a hoarding situation. Um, these are where three husky Malamute mixes and all of them had not been socialized. So some of the dogs you get are free running. They can be dogs that were either born free running, so even their parents were free running. And so you can get dogs that um, are essentially feral dogs where they had no interaction with people. Um, you can get dogs who had very limited interaction with people. So those may be the boarding dogs and puppy mill dogs. They could have seen one or two people. And generally with those dogs, what you see is that if they had a woman caretaker, they might be a little bit more inclined to be okay with women. If they had a man caretaker, they might be more okay with men, depending on if their experience with that person is good or bad. So the puppy mill dogs can be the same way. They can be um, under socialized so that they're not okay with kids or dogs or, you know, you really miss that window. And so everything outside of that's gonna be scary for the dog. Um, some of the dogs that we've been seeing are dogs from overseas. So dogs that were street dogs in another country, and then they're brought here and those dogs can be really fearful. Everything is new for those dogs. Um, they can even be dogs that somebody bought and didn't know that they needed to be socialized. So you can get dog puppies to go into someone's home and they were really socialized with that family and that house and everything else is brand new to those dogs. So, and, and most animals, their response to new is to be cautious or fearful. Um, there can be genetic issues involved. So we saw the pointer before, there are some genetic, known genetic codes that can predispose dogs to being anxious or fearful. So they have fearful pointers and we know that sound phobia is something um, that you can trace back genetically. Um, and it can be that they were socialized in the way that they were exposed to things, but those things were really bad. So a puppy who was abused by another person um, during those critical stages is more likely to see people as something fearful as they mature. And depending on who that individual was, they can kind of generalize that, all right, well, if I was um, scared by a woman, then all women are bad. That's, that type of situation can occur. So how do we know who the fearful dogs are and what fear looks like? Some of the things that you might see if you're doing um, behavior evaluations in shelter or a rescue setting, and we're gonna sort of look at all the links of this chain. So these dogs exist in the environment and some of them might stay in their home forever and people would never really understand that they had an issue because they don't are not taken out of the environment, they were socialized. Um, to let's say those dogs don't get to stay in that environment and they go into a rescue or they go into a shelter. And then from there, they go into a foster or they go into a home where they have a guardian. Um, and then they have veterinary procedures and they have, they're kind of connected to the wider world of dog care. So every link in that chain, we're gonna kind of take a look at because you might be involved in one part of that link, but it's helpful to know the other parts involved and how that dog got there and where that dog's going. So they might move away from contact. So you put your hand out and the dog moves away. Um, they're often crouching, curled up. So they'll sort of protect their, their, um, their underbelly. Um, they'll be a little bit tight. They tend to hug the walls if they can or find somewhere to hide. All animals will try to hide when they're scared so they're less vulnerable. And that can be going under tables and chairs and between your legs and that type of thing. Their tail is tucked, which is again, protecting all the vulnerable parts underneath. 
the mouth is shut or they can be panting. Um, their lips can be drawn, so the corners of their lips are drawn up. Um, their ears are pinned and they can be also rolling around. Um, so it can be, they can be rolling onto their back. Um, there's a display that spe specifically canids do, which is to roll over and have your leg up, which is to expose your underbelly um, when you can't escape. And some dogs will do that. Um, and it's actually an indication that they were somewhat socialized with people, but it's a sign that they're also extremely fearful of people and they can freeze. So the strategies that those dogs might use to deal with their immediate fear of us um, depends on that dog's experience and how fearful they are. And this is a look at a uh, ladder of aggression. Um, and this is also sort of this ladder of, of fear response for a dog. And it depends on how fearful that dog is and what things have worked in the past for them to be able to manage their fear. It's really important to go over again, that fear is a normal part of the behavioral range in animals and in people and um, in dogs. So it's more a matter of when are they fearful and how much are they fearful? Uh, is it disrupting their life? And can they get away with it? Um, can they get away from the thing that they're fearful of? So they might try to avoid it, which would be sort of this head turned down the bottom. Um, then there's the physiological responses. There's blinking and nose licking, um, kind of this uncertainty, creeping, walking away. Those are all trying to dissipate or to increase distance from the thing they're fearful of. Um, if they can't get away from it, you might get the freezing and the lying down. And then if they're pushed in, in, um, in a situation they can't, access the other behavior strategies that they've used in the past, then you might get growling, snapping, and bite. And that would be a normal response to being under threat for a dog. Um, so a bit, a bit about what is fear. Um, fear, and we've gone over many times already, is, is normal. We're all afraid at certain points. Um, something that's that you're fearful of is usually an object or a thing or an event that you can locate in time and space. So if I know where it is, a whole set of behavior strategies is available to me to deal with that. Um, I can walk away from that thing. Um, I could investigate it. Um, to be able to retreat from that actually gives me a bit of comfort knowing that I can control my access to the thing. So I'm allergic to bees. And when I see bees, I actually have a fear response to seeing a bee. But I don't have to run away because I know I can run away. But I, if they're really close to me, then I move away from the bee. Um, if I can't move away from the bee, that's when I start to have um, anxiety building. If I hear there's a bee and I can't locate it in the room, no matter what distance the bee could be from me, I also have anxiety. So not being able to locate the target um, will increase your anxiety because anxiety is a readiness to do something about something. Um, and if you can't locate what that thing is, then you kind of live in this constant state. Um, so they can exist, fear and anxiety, can, can they, can, they can exist together in the same animal, but they don't have to. You can have some, like a dog who is very fearful of sounds, um, but when there are no sounds, they're not anxious. They're not waiting for the sound to occur over time. Something that happens very easily with the fearful stimuli is that it's generalized very quickly across um, to other similar stimuli. And by stimuli, I mean like, let's say you have a dog and they're afraid of thunderstorms. It's really easy for the dog to generalize to fireworks. And sometimes those will stay separate, but a lot of times other loud sounds will start to kind of group into the original sound that scared the dog. Um, it could also be if they're very fearful of one bad visit from the vet and that vet happened to be a man, then they can generalize that it's all men, maybe all men in light colored coats, maybe all older men. They'll pick something about that event and then they generalize that it's all of those things. And one of the reasons that happens is that in biology, it's much safer to make that assumption that things are more dangerous and that they're not more safe. So for an example, if you saw a snake and that snake was a rattlesnake and tried to bite you, 
it's better for you biologically to say that all snakes are bad because the bite could be so detrimental to your survival than to be like, only that snake is bad. And I'm going to mess with every snake I see from here on out. So in a way, it's being um, conservative about what's dangerous in this world because it doesn't take that much energy from you to just avoid all snakes. It's better for your survival. And that's what we see with fearful dogs is that if they have a really bad experience, let's say they were trapped um, in a um, in a live trap, they might generalize that fear to a crate. And so you have a really hard time getting that dog then um, comfortable in a crate after that. Even though those were two different things for us, to the dog, their brain groups together what could be dangerous. It's really important to remember that the dog is the one who decides what the fearful stimulus is. So if the fear is triggered by a perceived danger, um, they, um, they go through this physiological response to the fear. They start to initiate some of their behavior strategies that they use when they're around this fearful stimuli. If they can't access that, often they'll start to escalate. So this is a picture of um, my dad's dog and somebody who was going around with a uh, costume on Halloween, um, which is already a terrifying um, costume. And the dog's trying to get away from it. And my dad's response was, you just get a little bit closer and you'll see that it's just a person in a nightmare costume. Uh, and the dog's then starting to crawl and, and um, drop to the ground. Like it is it is not getting more comfortable the closer it gets. And in our mind, we know that it's not scary. So we think if we get close enough and it doesn't hurt you, then it's gonna be okay. But it's sort of like me with the bee. I could touch the bee and not get stung that time. But in my mind, it's not safer. And that's how it is with the dogs. And we have this kind of, um, intention that we try to get the dogs closer to something they're afraid of. So if they're afraid of like the husband or they're afraid of the kids, if they get close enough, then they're going to realize that it's safe. But that's not how their brains work. And so a lot of when you're when we get into the training aspects, it's breaking it down into very small pieces for that dog so they can be exposed to the stimulus. They can initiate a new behavior um, kind of program this works for them and makes them feel comfortable and confident and then uh, we let them practice that at a distance that they choose you can't reinforce it by petting the dog that's something that um, that actually works to lessen their fear you can however let's say if I have my dog and I say it's going to be okay and then we go to the vet and they get a shot Pretty soon when I say it's going to be okay, the dog knows it's absolutely not going to be okay. She only says that when it's not going to be okay. So some of that can have an effect on that dog's anxiety level. But the calm, comfort, and let's say if my dad had moved to the other side, away from the rabbit, to a spot where Tulip was standing up and more comfortable, and then he pet her there, that's not going to reinforce that fear. Um, so we're going to look at so many of the dogs we have, they were not abused necessarily but they miss their socializing stages. But the effect psychologically on those dogs is as if they were. So you'll see these dogs are, um, can be crawling on the ground, they can be extremely fearful. Um, and, and we're catching up with that. If you now, you know, we don't usually see the beginnings, links in the chain. We catch them when they come to the shelter or the rescue. And at this point, we're trying to get those dogs um, to be comfortable with things they missed in life. So let's say they missed meeting kids. Now they're scared of kids on site. Then trying to help that dog be more comfortable is gonna take very careful graded exposures to help. And we get to that in the training scenario where they learn that those things aren't bad. And remember, it doesn't generalize fast because they don't generalize good things, they generalize bad things. So there's a few stages. First, we have sort of this pre-birth stage. So that we now know that even when the dog is pregnant, um, those pups are already learning things about the environment. They know that they can learn the types of food preferences. Um, they're exposed to the same hormones that the mom was exposed to. And high levels of stress in the mom can make a dog who's a little bit more sensitive to the environment. And probably there was some evolutionary advantage to this. If you want to increase the survival of pups and you're in a very stressful world, you want dogs that respond more drastically to threatening stimuli. So um, next we have this neonatal period. So this is after the pup is born. These little guys are um, uh, 
<laughs> they don't do a lot. They don't crawl a lot. They pretty much make little puppy noises and drink milk. They're not able to walk yet. They can't see yet. Um, at this stage, they are still learning. They're still learning from their mom, but they're not learning about socialization so much. They are learning about um, comfort going to their mom. And then the mom's response to the puppies crying is starting to have an effect on how resilient those puppies will be in adulthood. So the bottle babies that are pulled in this, this two week to three week to four to five, these dogs often have less resilience to stress because they didn't have some of that nurturing. They didn't have what, what is really designed to let them know that they are in a world where there's enough time for their mom to groom them, which is a more um, relaxing environment and more relaxing future. Um, and if their mom didn't have time to groom them and lick them and reassure them, then that starts to get their brains ready for, then you're gonna have to do it. You're gonna have to survive by yourself. And actually, if you know, a lot of bottle babies, they um, mature very quickly. So you get them walking and opening their eyes a little bit sooner, their bodies sort of go into a survival plan where they're going to need to ramp things up um, physically and behaviorally to deal with a more stressed out, um, more dangerous world, essentially. So the next stage is the transition period. This is from two to three weeks. This is the stage where they really go from neonatal to socialization. At this stage, a lot of new things are coming online. So as far as neural, um, neural activity, you're seeing a lot more connections. Um, the vision has come online. Uh, they're starting to move and walk around and orient towards things. Uh, some interactions are starting to happen with, with dogs. In the socialization period, so we have three to 16 weeks, which is a rough period of time. Um, and it depends a little bit between different families, um, and different breeds, how long that socialization period seems to go. Uh, at that stage, you're gonna have the dogs, um, the puppies are starting to play, starting to interact with each other. Um, there's play fighting. Uh, there's mirroring, following each other. That's what these little puppies are doing down here where there's two puppies scratching their necks. Um, but they start to pay attention to each other in the group and they are moving around, they're investigating things. This is the stage when they're learning who's in their social group, how you behave in your social group, things like how hard you fight, um, to listen to other dogs, signals that are done playing. It's a lot of the communication that's gonna be necessary for a dog in developing as a social species. Um, actually, canids that are less social, they start off their world with just fighting, and they fight quite a bit before they start their play period of life. Um, so things like the fox and coyote might spend more time fighting, um, or the wolf and the dog start playing earlier. Uh, the juvenile period, so this is socialization period, we're gonna see most of these dogs after that or towards the end of that. Puppy mill dogs are, they're gonna miss most of their socialization period. This time when you wanna get them exposed to lots of people and bikes and cars and they need to learn at that stage, there's a template, this thing is safe. If they miss this period, then we start to have more fear issues as they develop. Um, in the juvenile period, you, you're gonna see some of this, like the dog might be a little bit more timid. If you, um, either adopt a dog or you get a dog in as a foster, they're gonna be a little bit slower to adapt to a new environment. So if I um, introduce them to a dog, they maybe they'll hide a little bit longer. It could even be five, five minutes is a long time for that. Um, if the dog was socialized and had good interactions, it would be less than 10 seconds where they would be investigating and doing something like that. Um, and the same thing with new environments. They might have a harder time if you being out in the open, playing in a big field, um, they're gonna not adjust and they're not gonna be quite as resilient if they've missed in the socialization period. So you're always gonna see it in this, this three months of puberty, which is three to six months. Um, by the time you hit puberty, six to seven, um, all the way to um, 18 to two years, those dogs in that stage are, are gonna truly start developing more serious problems. So some of the stuff we took to be a timid dog is gonna look more like a fearful dog. And this is sort of the difference between Maybe a 10 year old being um, timid and shy and not wanting to go out to getting um, 13 to 17 to 20, and you start to see that that might turn into more social anxiety and might turn into more serious problems that are starting to interfere with how that dog um, is navigating the world. And as they get older, those things become a little bit more rigid and less um, flexible to changes in the environment. As the puppies are going through this, they have 
kind of one through six stages. You have sort of an, an if they're open, they're, some of their um, possibilities have been predetermined genetically that they can and cannot do, but they're still open to those possibilities. So they have a range of things that they can accomplish in that time. As you limit their exposure or you give them bad experiences, it starts to limit as they go into, um, into adulthood what they can do. And it doesn't mean we can't push them up and down so that if we have a dog down here who's really fearful, I can move them towards less fearful. But when they're a puppy, you have a bigger range. If they start down here fearful and I give them lots of positive experiences, it's easier for us to get them up here. But it's never a closed book. You can always teach the dog something um, new about how to navigate fearful stimuli. So that was a look at just who are fearful dogs and where they come from and, and what is it. And, and we're really, in that section, we're grouping together um, these dogs that miss socialization, which are probably puppy male dogs, um, in some regard, uh, the hoarding dogs, um, the, the dogs who grew up in a one family, maybe they grew up in a basement, um, that type of thing. And you really, as you get the dog out, you start to realize, well, what are they missing and where is the problem located? The first thing that you have to do, that's, that's kind of the links before this one, um, is make them feel safe. So in this section, we're going to look at how do you make them safe in a shelter? How am I going to make that um, animal safe in a home? Um, and how do you make them safe in a foster home? Um, and how do we do things like transport the dog? There are things that need to be done for the dog, um, veterinary care, and what kind of ways can we do this where the dog is going to be less stressed? And what might be some of the outcomes to pushing it when I have to for the dog's safety further down the chain when the dog is in a home? Um, so we'll take a first look at the securing of the dog. So this is this was um, um, this was a dog that was an Adrian, I think, that I went down to go get. And this dog had been running feral for quite some time. You can kind of see he's covered in dreads. Um, people couldn't touch him. We got a long, um, a leash over over his neck, and then in this picture, he's looking. He was really nervous. Um, he needed to be shaved. There were a lot of things that had to be done, and these things had to be done really slow because this dog had been running free for some time and the shortcuts I might take in the, in the short run to be like, all right, let's just get them all clean and get it over with. Um, that could affect actually his later links in the chain when he's in a home. Um, things like handling could become an issue at that point. Um, overall, his experience with us starting from the very beginning is to be as low stress as possible to alleviate some of the problems that could develop in the future. So if it's a feral dog or the puppy mill dogs, you're trying to find ways to move them that are low stress. So food can help for some dogs, but a lot of our real extreme cases, that's not going to be an option because they're not going to want it. Some of the feral dogs are really hungry and so it can be used for things like if they have to be trapped, if they have to be um, kind of cornered into a fence so we can get close to them. Some dogs, if you have time, you can put food down day after day so that they're comfortable in that location and build a relationship with someone. Um, and there'll be a dog a little bit later who, um, that's how that dog was secured because that dog was running loose as well. And it was days and days of feeding the dog. Um, but sometimes they're running near a highway or somewhere where it's a little bit um, difficult. And if it's possible to put a slip lead over the dog, uh, that's one way that you can possibly do it when the slip lead tightens, if that dog's never had a leash on, then you have just a dog alligator running. It can be really dangerous for you and the dog um, to try to figure out how to do that. So going slow and trying to figure out the least stressful way to stay under that threshold is really important. You also, if you're trying to secure a dog who's loose or if you adopt a dog and they get loose and they get scared, walking straight towards a dog is always a confrontation for those dogs. So going in a zigzag or walking around or looking like you're doing something else or for some dogs who might like dogs, using another dog to get them interested. Um, this dog liked other dogs, which is how we got this dog. We got close enough to this dog. Um, and there's another um, dog coming up, which that dog also liked other dogs, and that's how I got that dog um, back to my place. Um, so if you have, there's, there's this other group of dogs, so those are kind of the feral group, but if there's another group, you see you adopt them and you get them into your home, 
how do we secure those dogs outside? You can use a long line for some of those dogs. Um, most of them, if they've been feral, know how to jump up on things and hop fences. So you have to keep that in mind that those dogs would be a flight risk um, until they have a really good relationship with someone. Um, you can use a crate to catch some of the dogs. Sometimes you can set up kind of like X10 alleys so the dogs move within this, um, almost the, the old way used to catch fish. They move down until they get in the crate and then you can shut the crate. Um, sometimes they'll go into the crate just to hide. Uh, it really depends on the dog. And you're watching to see, is the dog feel more comfortable hidden? Is the dog who wants to go under things? Then you can put a blanket on top of the crate. There's things that I can do to get a dog out of the field and to do that safely with minimizing the bad interaction the dog is going to have with me because every bad interaction is going to affect their behavior um, rehab in the future. So those were some more ideal ways to be able to get a dog. Um, there are emergency ways that dogs need to be um, caught. So trapping is on that list. Um, trapping is where you put food out for the dogs and they go to the crate day after day after day until they're more comfortable and then finally you can shut the, shut the door of the crate and then transport them as quick as possible. For some dogs that were socialized and have just been running feral for a while, the process might not be as traumatic. Um, you can still have some side effects to that. For dogs that were truly wild, um, you probably will, they might not even eat food again, honestly. Sometimes when you go back and you try to feed them food, now food is associated with being a trap and, and you have a whole other issue of trust that you have to work on. So obviously there's this um, balance of what is safe for the dog, what do I have to do, and what's real, what's necessary. Um, and you just make that assessment wisely, and knowing that there could be some side effects to some of the choices you make. Um, so, so if you have to transport the dogs, um, puppy mill dogs, sometimes you can still crawl into a crate if they've had one, they, they're used to confined areas. And you don't have to leash them and move them, which is a whole other thing they're going to have to learn how to do. But you can just move the crates. I can transfer the crate from one car, or I can trade a rescue a different crate. Um, Why I get them where they need to go. I can take that crate just to a shelter and take the crate and put it into the kennel. So the dog has this little safe place in this next environment that it goes to. Um, if you own one of these dogs, these like a feral dog, the puppy mill dogs, dogs that you can't touch yet yourself, um, and you're just trying to get this dog to be friendly with you, a crate can give that dog a safe place in the home. So this is the beginning of when we talk about how to make that dog feel safe in the home. Um, one of those ways is that they have a crate, maybe the crate they came in, that crate goes to an area, the kitchen, the bathroom, and then you put an X pen around that so the dog can come out of the crate, but if you come into the room and they're not comfortable, they go back into their crate. The thing is the dog knows that you're not gonna come and pull it out of the crate and you're not gonna cross the X10 and try to, to talk to it or move it or touch it. Um, and that's the very beginning of a dog being able to be under threshold enough where they don't fear for their lives and their safety that they can think. And that is the goal with a fearful dog in your home. You wanna be able to get them to a point where they can relax so that they can learn. They can't learn when they're in a constant state of waiting for the other um, kind of foot to fall. That, um, that really inhibits what they can learn and it keeps their mind and their brain in the state of just reaction instead of being able to plan the future. So um, if your dog is afraid of a leash, which is another, let's say that maybe you can touch them but they don't want to be leashed, they'll kind of hang out around you, but if you reach them, they're out of there. Um, for those dogs, you don't have to move them with a leash, but make plans of safe ways to move them. So I can use um, x pens to cut to kind of move certain areas so they don't go into the basement and hide, but I can get them outside to a smaller yard and they can get them back inside to a yard. Um, and then I'll start training that dog to walk itself into the clip. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the training area where he can, he now he, the dog can be around me, they feel a little bit safer. And then eventually I can train the dog to clip into a leash and walk around me and then learn that leash pressure isn't scary. Um, and that can be a, a long process. I've seen it take from um, a month to two months to longer, and it really depends on the dog. It's not, and a lot of work with fearful dogs, it isn't a race to get to the end. Um, it's a process for you and the dog, and you're measuring the small goals that you're able to reach together. So here's a 
dog from a puppy mill who was afraid of new locations and surfaces. You can kind of see here the food is being used as a lure for that dog. So he's going over there to get the food, but he's not necessarily doing a behavior to get the food. He doesn't really know how it's working. So I dropped some food by, by him because I can see he's trying to crawl the food. She gave him a little bit there. So, so he's moving, but but he's still scared of the ground. He's ready to go back. <laughs> and someone tried to put their hand there to kind of stop him. If they want to go back, you want them to know they can go back. Remember the scariest thing about like me and the bee? So I'm scared of bees. And if I reach for the bee and someone's like, no, you have to touch it. It's a hundred times worse than if I can do it, but I know I can take my hand away when I want to. Um, so if in this scenario for that dog to turn around and then learn that it actually can escape, um, it can really intensify their anxiety in the moment of how they're kind of managing that. So this dog was um, a puppy mill dog along with a whole bunch of other pointers and they had never, they had not been socialized. So they were not genetically um, in any way necessarily bred to be really fearful. Um, they had just missed this window of socialization in new places. Um, it was they were all still pretty good with people, um, considering uh, what they'd been through, but they did not adjust well to new services, new places, all the things that you know are kind of on your puppy socialization list. So here are two dogs, and so these guys actually, these guys came from um, an owner who passed away, and they had never been socialized outside of that person's home. So they had intense fear of new places. And you can kind of see here, they don't have a safe place. They're kind of curled up along the side of the fence and they're as small as possible. Um, you might think they would just get used to it and some dogs can, but more than likely actually what happens is they, they sort of flood. They don't learn any behavior strategies to deal with when they are scared. And these guys stayed like this for months. Um, and it could go a lot faster if they felt like they were in a safe place and they were going out to explore. All their memories are just a little bit different if they know they're in control and they can leave when they want to. So some considerations of how you can make a dog feel safe. And this goes with a, a lot of other species and, and we can be like this too. Um, having a covered crate, if that dog is a dog who likes to go into a small safe place. But I keep the door open of that crate or take the door off completely if it's an airliner crate. A quiet corner away from traffic. So if this is a dog in a shelter, you want the most um, isolated, quiet area that you can find in the shelter. This is in your home. You don't want it to crate right by the front door thinking like, oh, he's getting used to people moving more. That puts more stress on the dog and it kind of slows your progress down. It's a lot easier if you can find quiet room to the back of the house, maybe a bedroom, um, somewhere that the dog is going to be able to let their guard down. And I almost want the dog to be there um, to the point where they're like bored enough, they want to go see what's going on outside. And then all of a sudden, the things that they're exploring and the enrichment they're doing outside of their crate um, builds their confidence, but has a lot of value for them as well. I want to be careful of the walking surfaces. So for some dogs, where I choose to do it can interfere with how fast it goes. If they have to go up and down stairs, um, that can set me back. If I pick a place that's, um, and you don't always have a choice, but if there are stairs and every day I have to pick that dog up and take them up and down stairs to go outside, that will interfere with my relationship with the dog. Um, so I take that into consideration if it's a possibility for me to be able to adjust where I put them, then I do. Um, if they have to walk over a shiny surface or a metal grate or something that's really scary and they have to do that every day or every couple of days, that can also interfere with their experience of what the outside world is like. I'm trying to set it up so that these dogs are in an environment where they feel safe. So whenever you start to see fearful behavior, if you can pinpoint what it is about that environment, See if you can change that thing. See if you should prioritize it a little bit higher in your training list. Um, or in some cases, like if you live in an apartment, you have to go through it um, to be able to get them back to their room. Then we'll find a way, um, and we'll talk about that too, to make it the least negative experience possible with the 
least impact on your relationship as possible. Um, for some dogs, they might be more comfortable with a barrier. So they might have already learned, like the puppy mill dogs sometimes have learned that they're safe behind a barrier and that you're not going to touch them, but they're really afraid of an open grate or an open door. Uh, so for those dogs, sometimes you start your relationship with the barrier between you. Um, I'm also really careful not to have a direct approach to the dog. So if I was training uh, a dog here, I might turn my body slightly to the side and I'm still relaxed and I'm training, but I'm not moving into that dog so that it feels that it's a little bit under threat and it's gonna to have to move away. Instead, it should feel curious and like it wants to come see me. Um, if I see that dog's uncomfortable and I move back or I change my body posture to make it more relaxed, that's actually the, the first communication that you have with the dogs, and it gains you a lot of trust from that dog. To know that they can communicate with you starts to build how quickly they're going to go um, investigate or work on a relationship with you. If the dog feels that it can't get away and that you're pushing in and you're reaching towards it while it's in a crate, um, that's detrimental to the relationship. Whereas if I started to reach in, the dog turned its head and I pulled my hand out, it gives that dog a lot of confidence that I might actually be a social partner. Even if they were never socialized to people, to be able to have that communication um, boosts their confidence with you and it starts to change the behavior response you're gonna get with those dogs. Um, in the very beginning when you get these guys, you don't wanna expose them to everything. Kind of our instinct with a lot of things that we're excited about is to try to share it with other people, visitors, dogs. Um, you want to take them to the pet store to show people your dog. For, for these dogs um, that are fearful in those situations, that's going to set them back. It's going to slow down the progress and it can hurt the relationship with you. Um, they can also increase the chance of a bite. If you have a dog who's fearful for a very long time, under feeling that it's under threat, and I put more and more pressure on that dog, the chances they're gonna go from fearful to defensive start to increase. And so we see really fearful dogs um, taken to the pet store on the first day of adoption, and they might bite in that scenario where it would have been really difficult to be able to provoke a bite, but it was just so much happened so fast for that dog that they went into a defensive state. And then they learn to bite. They learn that biting um, can end the interaction. And you have one more behavior that you don't want that dog to have on their kind of their behavior palette. So it's a much better idea, although it's a little bit hard, you know, to be patient to set your dog aside again to a quiet corner, to a back room, finding somewhere for your dog to be comfortable and to be able to let their guard down, so that you get to kind of see who they are and that they can decompress while you decide how you're going to start introducing other people, possibly other pets to that dog. Um, really, once you get them down to a baseline, the, the key in the very beginning, and it can feel like you're, um, you're not making progress because what you want to see is the dog getting better at all these things. The key is you have to find a place to start. And if you can't find a place to start, you will end up just spinning your wheels slightly above maybe what your dog, what your dog can actually do. So, um, Again, if I had to start for some dogs, you have to start with them in the back room, the crate, in an X pen. You just drop off food and you leave and you come back. That's going to make you more progress than if I just put the collar on the dog and then make them walk up and down the stairs and go see people and do all these things. It also increases the chance that those dogs will bite as they start to be more comfortable and they learn that they can't get away from those uh, situations. I'm going to try to protect those dogs from being pet. Dogs, most of the dogs, you have to um, you have to really watch their body language to realize do they like to be pet. Most dogs, for sure, don't want to be pet by things they're afraid of. Um, if you kind of remember that that picture of um, my dad and his his dog and the super scary bunny, that dog doesn't want to get pet by that bunny. Petting is not a reinforcement when it comes from the nightmare bunny. <laughs> So what you want is the dog is initiating a contact because it's learned how to ask for affection. Some dogs might come up and they might nose you, they might paw you. Some dogs might not like to be pet. Um, you have to kind of wait and see how the dog feels about it. But one of the things to remember is that petting is not just for us. Like it does, we, we like to do it, it's soothing for us, but it's not good for the dog 
if the dog finds it uncomfortable or aversive or they're trying to get over it. Um, it's not, they'll just get used to it. They, maybe they can give up after a while, but you're not going to enjoy it while it's being forced upon them, just like you would enjoy um, a forced back rub. So the last I have on here, because this is something that is not going to work for every dog, and it's certainly not going to work for a lot of dogs, is that some of the puppy mill dogs or dogs that were in hoarding situations, they sort of derive a lot of their confidence from other dogs being in the environment. And by themselves, they have no confidence. So you might see sometimes there'll be dogs that are from puppy mills and they want to adopt out a dog to a house with another confident, happy dog. Because this dog is going to pick up his cues from other dogs as to what is safe and what is not. And you can also use this sometimes with behavior work when you're trying to either bring in a social dog where that dog is going to follow another dog. Um, I've had what was the feral dog, follow my dog, and jump right into the van without me having to leash or do anything. It just was so relieved that there was another dog who spoke dog body language that it dealt with the fact that I was there and followed her just as if like, um, like it was on a lifeboat. And sometimes I see that happen with the dogs who were um, in puppy mill situations um, where they're crowded in with a lot of other dogs. Well, it feels really weird to be by yourself. And they were using the other dogs um, as an indication of safety. Uh, so they'll pick up on that. For that to work, the other dog has to be really friendly, has to be confident, and it has to be comfortable with the things that you're trying to socialize your dog to. And remember, this is not for every dog. Some dogs were not socialized to other dogs, and so they do not find those dogs either as social partners um, or they don't, or there's no response whatsoever. So I've seen a few who will say they're not aggressive, but they also could not care less. That dog to them is as if I had um, a lawn ornament in the same room. They're not paying attention to that dog. They're not seeing that I'm petting that dog. They're still just looking at you. So for those dogs, that's not gonna be helpful, but I have it on here because it's something that I consider um, with dogs who've had an experience and were socialized with other dogs. Um, and sometimes I'll, um, if, I, if you're doing a consult, asking questions about how that dog's been with other dogs, or do we know if it was with other dogs when it was in the original, like a puppy mill situation? Um, if it was in a hoarding situation, was it in a container with other dogs? That kind of thing. Um, so in your home, the, we already covered this, low traffic area of the home, you want it to be quiet. Um, one of the worst places that, that I go to when I go into a home with a really fearful dog is that the dog's crate is two inches away from the front door. So what that would look like for the dog is you're in your, what would be a safe place, and then people spontaneously appear that are strangers two inches from what, what is your little safe bubble there. Um, that actually slows progress down a lot for that dog because the safe place isn't a truly a safe place. I want them to feel like they can get away from a new person or intruder that kind of comes into the area. Oh, this is that little, so the little dog in the foreground, this photo here was the dog who was running um, as a feral dog in Jackson for a while. And she's the dog who followed my dog and jumped right into the car. So she was very dog social and she learned everything from the other dogs. Um, she wasn't anybody, um, initially she was really fearful of men, very fearful of women, but more so of men. You couldn't touch her. Um, she would go in a 20 foot radius around you whenever she could in the house. Um, so my first goal for her, obviously, is to get her to feel safe. I found that the other dogs were helpful for that for her. And then let her make her choices on her own. I never made her come closer to me for food. I made her, um, made her know that she could walk away from me, and I never walked towards her in the house. If she was on the couch, I would go way out of my way to walk around her so that she didn't get startled and have to run away from me. Um, because the, each time I do that, that's a bad experience that she's had with me. So I started her new experiences very slow after I felt that she was really comfortable with where she was and I could see she had some skills to navigate. Then I began to show her new things like go for walks in the field, go do more fun activities that she can handle. And my goal is for her to make sure that she's happy. Some of the feral dogs are way more comfortable outside than they are inside the house. Same thing with some of the street dogs that we get from overseas. Um, 
So finding safe ways for them to be able to go outside can be helpful when you're starting to build a relationship. And remember, part of building that relationship is responding to when they're stressed and when they want you to stop. Just knowing that you're going to stop really changes how that dog might feel. Um, and in that time, I'm trying to learn what do they eat, what are they afraid of, and how start to make my plan for how am I going to deal with that. So maybe if they had been caught um, with a leash, they could be afraid of the sight of a leash. It's very, very common. Um, just like you would be concerned about a snare. For them, if their introduction was you got stuck in it and you tried to escape and you couldn't get away, the next time they see it, they're going to have a fear response to that. So beginning the reintroduction of what does a leash mean and what could it represent for that dog, if that's one of the, the issues that I'm working on. So this is going back to, and again, I just want to say that this is not going to work for every dog. These are some dogs that it has worked for. Um, and there are some guidelines if you, if it is a social dog and you think that it's a dog that might really benefit from a friendly dog helping it um, learn the world is safe. Some of the considerations to remember is that being very scared does suppress aggression. So if they are very afraid of you and you bring another dog and they're ignoring that dog, they could still be dog aggressive, but they're just not demonstrating it in that environment because they're so scared of you that they're not going to show it. So I'm looking for, they see another dog and they get really happy. Um, fear can also suppress guarding behavior. So they could be a resource guarding dog and we don't know anything about how they resource guard yet or how they respond to that. So you need to be really careful if you're using another dog because of that as well. Um, it could be that my other dog that I'm using is reactive, um, which then my fearful dog is gonna be like, I knew it, people or dogs are bad and you're gonna have another behavior problem. It could be <laughs> that both dogs are fearful. So in this bigger picture here, both dogs are fearful. If you take two scared dogs and you put them together, then it's harder for you to convince either dog that it's safe. And sometimes those dogs will be inseparable. Um, and so you keep them together and you work with what you have, but maybe you don't take two dogs that don't know each other and put those two scared dogs together because that's gonna make your job a lot harder because they um, are really looking to the other dog and saying, well, he's scared, so I, that I should be scared too. So those are some of the considerations. In this big picture here, these are two dogs that are both scared, both under socialized. And then down here, one of these dogs is my dog, the dog in the back, the black and white pity. The one in the front was the dog who was the feral dog. So she learned from him and he really liked us. And so therefore she learned to really like us too. Okay, so that's just a bit about, again, the first chain, where they come from, what they do, kind of the second link. How do you make that dog feel safe? Um, and now we're going to look into the training aspect of this. And it's important to remember, so when you get this dog in, you kind of uh, give it a little bit of time to de decompress, make sure it feels safe. At this stage, you want to connect with your vet and you let them know what's going on with this fearful dog. It might not be that the dog is quite ready to make it to the veterinary, um, veterinary office. Uh, it might be a big step for them, but to know that Chronic fear and anxiety is a real issue, and you don't just train your way out of that for a lot of dogs. Um, but it's important to also give that dog a little bit of time to decompress because changes are really scary, and you have to really know the dog well enough to know what you're dealing with. You need to know if that dog is generally fearful. Are they fearful outside? Are they fearful inside? Are they showing aggression? Are they resource guarding? Each one of these dogs is going to present a little bit differently, and again, that goes back to fear is in all of us. It isn't really that there's just fearful dogs. We say that just so that we can talk about it, but all dogs have some spectrum of this. Uh, the people that are going to be listening are going to have all the way from a feral dog that you can't touch to a dog who hides in the basement when there is a thunderstorm. So there's, there's a big range that we're really talking about, and we don't have time in this webinar to um, focus on each individual slice of it. I just hope there's enough here that you can kind of get the ball rolling on whatever issue that you're working with, with within this subgroup here. So some of the things I have to be careful of once you get the dog into your home is that, again, the dog decides it's scary. So I have to be careful of things that are scary to the dog. So that could be children. It could be um, another roommate or someone who's living in the house, your spouse. Um, could be doorways. I want to start to identify what those things are, and, and then I'll make a plan how to address those things. Um, something that can be a problem if I don't offer that dog a safe place when that dog's scared it doesn't know where to go so you get dogs maybe hiding in their couches um I've seen dogs hiding under chairs 
um, they will they will try to find a behavior strategy to deal with their fear. That's why when you give them a place to hide, like a corner or a room or a safe place, being able to have that, they know what they can do. They're practicing the behavior and they get more confident in their ability to be able to be safe with that. If they're hiding in their chair in the living room and you have guests over, then they're really set to be in a situation where people are still going to be talking to them and maybe trying to reach for them. If they know when guests come over, I can run to another room, they can truly be compressed in there and then they can decide to come out if they want to. Um, you need to be careful of dragging or cornering the dog. So in a way, I think of fear as an injured animal. You don't make an injured animal walk and you don't corner an injured animal because you're going to get bit. So when you see an animal um, try to hide, that's a fearful animal. And if you reach in to try to remove it from its space, you're really compromising what the animal tried to do to deal with their fear, and it's not working anymore, and they're going to have to escalate or become defensive in their, in their next actions. You also risk um, the, the possibility that your dog could run from you. So if you become someone who drags your dog or moves them into these environments, you moving towards a dog can predict scary situations and it kind of sets you back in your relationship with your dog. So an example of this might be, I have a dog and I'm thinking, all right, well, I'm going to socialize my dog by putting a leash on him and I'll just have him come into this room where my friends and family are and they'll toss food for him. If I start to walk into the room and the dog is backing up, but I don't let the dog leave, the dog loses its faith in me, for one. It doesn't like the people anymore and it's definitely not going to eat. So I really spoiled what what that dog is gonna record about people coming over. The dog is gonna think, okay, people are bad, I can't escape from people, and when there's food and people, the food has become an indication of a stressful environment, and they might not eat even that type of food again. Um, and then over petting and handling. Again, we're really cuddly, and we like dogs because we love dogs. We either grew up with dogs, or they mean something really special to us. And we want to show them that. And a lot of the ways that humans do that is through petting. And that doesn't work for every dog. For some dogs, um, that type of affection was, um, they were never exposed to it or they can have sensitivity to how that feels. It can also have been poisoned by being pet too much. So some dogs, they don't know how to leave and someone is petting and petting and petting and petting and petting and then the dog starts to show the teeth or the snap. Um, so, be really careful with over petting, petting and handling. And we have some ways that we can help you um, manage that by you can wait for the dog to ask. Um, they initiate the petting. You pet for a second, you stop, and you wait for them to ask for more. So we call it the three or five second petting rule. And we use that actually for exotic animals um, who need contact still, but you don't want to do it against their, without permission. Uh, and we use it for fear, fearful dogs, feral dogs. Um, Really, really, it makes the petting more enjoyable. So you kind of think, well, I'm not going to be able to pet as much. But if they know that they're initiating it, it has more value. And so in the end, what you get is a dog who enjoys being pet by you rather than tolerates being pet by you. Okay, so here's some ways to deal with the flight risk of fearful, feral, um, and a lot of the dogs that um, you just have moved in, but you know their flight risk. So for some of them, GPS collars can work really well. And these are dogs that when they get away, they're not going to come back to you. They either don't know you well enough, or they were running for so long that they've learned to stay, stay as far away from you as possible as soon as they know they're off leash. Um, so a GPS collar can help you locate that dog, and then you'll be able to do things that we talked about in the beginning where we talked about securing the dog. How do you get the dog back into a secure environment? Um, for dogs you know are a flight risk, Two leashes um, to two points. So a leash to a harness or a leash to a flat collar. Um, if your dog is is a flight risk and is also a bite risk to anybody, um, there's a muzzle as an option too. And a muzzle can be an option for, for training a dog to love a muzzle if they have to end up going to the vet or do handling. That's a good idea anyway. Um, for a lot of the dogs that have come out, the two points of contact what can happen is if they get scared outside and they start to spin or to um, um, try to run away from you while they're connected to you, the clips can come undone. So I'm really careful with the type of clips that you use. And, and if the dog isn't going to come right back to you if it gets off lead, 
don't let it loose in the yard because then you have to chase it around and get it back. It's much easier if you have the dog on a long line um, so that I never have to have me appearing with a leash is, is the beginning of a punishment where I'm gonna drag you back in the house and that type of thing. Um, I try to use two um, safety measures when those dogs are outside. So either two leashes, um, and it can be two long lines, um, a leash and a fence, just something so that if one thing fails, I don't lose that dog. Um, because of the, the feral or the fearful dogs can be really hard to get back. Uh, martingale collar for dogs that have the possibility of slipping their neck or slipping their collar off their neck or dogs that have a thicker neck or really small head, that can be something. And the freedom harness also has a cinch above it and it's kind of the same idea is that some dogs will try to pull the harness over their back and that harness prevents that from happening so it just secures the dog a little bit better. And so these are just options for the dog. It's also, this is a good time to note, some of the dogs um, have learned to very quickly eat the leash um, with their teeth in the back. So if you have a dog like that, using a material such as you can use a chain, you can use something that's a little bit more resilient to being chewed off really thick um, leashes so that you don't have a dog who just reaches down and they can shear it right off, just like the way they could shear a harness off. Um, and keep that in mind, that's one of those dogs that can do that, that they know what they're, they know how to take those things off. So we touched on this a little bit. This is handling concerns. It's important for the dog in, this, in these stages that the handling is enjoyable. Um, just forcing a dog to be next to you doesn't do anything to raise their confidence and it doesn't do anything to make them like handling more. So you can kind of see in this picture here, um, the dog is tolerating this situation, but it's not gonna record this as this was an enjoyable situation. So always let the dogs approach you. Don't, don't go over to a dog that's laying down. If I, if, I, if I saw a dog on the couch and I wanted to go pet that dog, I'd probably sit down like five, maybe five feet away from the dog at some distance where I didn't startle the dog. And I would wait and see if the dog wants to be pet. If it wants to be pet, it's gonna to come to me. If it doesn't, then we're just gonna enjoy that, that moment together. Um, initiate the five second petting rule. So see they, they did want to be pet. Let's say I sat down and the dog starts to come over to me to be pet. I might put my hand out where it can investigate if it wants to. If it tries to nuzzle my hand up to be pet, I'll pet it for maybe three to five seconds and then I stop. So, and then you let the dog think about it and does it want the petting to continue? If it does, it's going to repeat the behavior it did to get pet. So it'll start to nuzzle your hand again and you can pet again. So this could also be something if, you, if one person in the house has a really good relationship with the dog and I want to transfer that to somebody else in the house, start that with you and then later have the other person um, uh, learn the rules for petting so that the dog, when it is ready to be pet by that person, it can do the same thing. It knows how to be pet by that person. Um, and it's, I can't reiterate enough how important it is to listen to the dog's body language. One of the most important aspects to building a relationship is communication and for dogs that's that's when they give us a signal that either they want to stop or they want to continue or um, whatever when you're reading the dog body language and we have a, a whole webinar on just body language um, that it's being listened to and that begins this two-way conversation between you and the dog so that you start to have um, uh, what is a history together of being successful and that's the beginning of building that dog's confidence okay so now we're going to move on to the training map, which is really more what we do. And remember at this point, you've already connected with your veterinarian to be able to see if there were any medical considerations that were contributing to your dog's phobias and their, and their fears. Because some of these things are going to work much better when you use a multimodal approach. Um, but right now we're going to focus on the training bit because that's what I do. So, um, again, this is the very beginning of of the relationship, sometimes it doesn't involve food, sometimes it involves just your space and being able to have the animal feel they can control the environment. So I wanted to be in a safe place, which is really key to learning. If they're not feeling safe, they're not gonna learn. So once they're safe, how do I start to build a relationship? I can walk by and drop food for that animal. Um, I can toss food behind the animal, so he goes behind and he gets the food, and then they can choose a distance to train with me. They can walk back towards me, and I'll throw the food behind them again so that they can go eat it comfortably and they can show me the distance they want to train at. That's really the key when I'm just building closeness so they can get close enough to me. I want to work on the communication skills between me and the dog. If the dog gives me a signal and then I move away, 
that dog's going to increase their confidence, but I have to be careful how I move away. I have to move slowly. If I move suddenly and I startle the dog, then I didn't really have what I wanted to, um, to do for that dog. So in the very beginning, you're just working out, is fast movement scary for the dog? Um, is loud, are loud noises scary for the dog? And I'm working on that, and then I'm giving the dog control over that. So I don't make them go closer to that thing. I allow them to escape if they want to. Um, and I'm locating in time the things that are scary for that dog. And once I've located those things, and I'll say, so for this dog in this photo, he was afraid of men. Women were not hard to get in. We could come in with food and we could work with the dog very readily, but really fearful of men. So once I figured that out, um, that was now my goal. He's not afraid of new places. He's not afraid of kids. He's just afraid of men. My, my behavior and my training program is now going to be, how do I change how he feels about men? And then the last step is to give him skills to navigate in situations that he could still be afraid of that I can't predict. So we're going to look a little bit about how do you change the feelings for the dog. So this is that little feral dog. And I talked a little bit about she was really fearful if you were um, in the same enclosure as her. And so I sat outside of a big pen. She had a ton of space that she could move around in that pen. Um, and she could, she could come up for food. I started by tossing food behind her and then eventually led to feeding her between the bars and then went and I was able to click onto her and then I was able to take another dog and we followed and we got to the car. So um, for her, it was people. She wasn't afraid of new places because she'd be running feral. Um, um, I think the other dog she was running with was shot. So she was pretty scared of people and um, gunshot, I think is what her other problem was. Um, and I really want to pair myself with the least stressful experience, a fun experience, and to make her already feel, and this, this is just, just me just picking her up for the first time. I just want her to be able to feel like she is in control and to make it as unstressful as possible for her to start our relationship. So once you recognize that the dog is fearful, and we're gonna go back to the example of men, there's a couple ways that we can change how that dog feels about it. And let's say they start off on this kind of in the red zone where they're sensitive or they're fearful. When they perceive that stimulus, their body starts to ramp up to deal with the perceived threat. If they had no response, they would be in this yellow zone. So that would be they just don't respond to it. And if they're in this green zone, that means they really like it. We're trying to move the things that are in this red, sensitive, fearful zone up towards the loves it side. So I want them to be able to get into the dog loves men um, and as far away from possible as they're fearful. If I just make it to desensitize, it's really easy for the dog to be scared again. So what might happen with a desensitization, if I just desensitize, let's say a man comes over, he sits in the living room, and the dog has screwed into the house, and it kind of gets used to the guy at that distance. As soon as that person stands up, the dog goes back to being fearful and sensitive. So desensitization happens in nature. It's very easy for them to go back to being fearful and sensitive. Uh, that's why with classical conditioning, we're able to move it up with positive pairing of maybe toys or food or freedom or anything the dog really likes. You pair it with the bad thing, which is men in this situation, um, and you can move it towards they, they love it. So it's called a graded, um, graded counter conditioning where I change how that dog feels in very incremental steps by pairing something really good. Um, we used to have a very cute puppy sucking on a bottle. So a puppy might have a really good um, association with a bottle. And if I really want them to like handling, I can handle them a little bit and then give them the bottle so that I can start working on some of these bottle babies really liking handling. Sensitizing is where you have a stimulus that occurs at a level that scares the dog and then it makes them more sensitive to that. Um, a good example might be a dog is trying to walk through your kitchen and they slip one time um, on a slippery floor and they make it outside, but they come in the next day and they're a little bit stiff now on the floor. And because they're stiff, their chances of slipping have increased, so they slip again. That's sometimes all it takes for a dog to decide they're never going in the kitchen again. That's called sensitizing. So sensitizing is really easy to happen. Again, with nature, you really want a few bad things to leave a really big impression on you. 
and we're more likely to pick up on some stimulus more than others. Um, and things like that are pretty common. Um, and some dogs are just more sensitive to that. If they haven't had a lot of good experiences out in the world, they're more um, easily sensitized to bad situations that they might find versive in some manner. So flooding is another, um, uh, flooding is another aspect of how you can reach desensitization. Uh, that would occur maybe by you have people in the living room and you take the dog and you put it on a leash and you drag it into the living room, it doesn't want to be there. You sit there for 20 minutes, the dog starts to appear to relax. Maybe you can even take food afterwards. One of the problems with flooding uh, a dog is pushing them into a fearful environment and then not allowing them a way to escape. You, one, you increase your risk of a bite because the dog can't escape if they're scared. Two, you have a high probability of sensitizing the dog to that environment. So even though they look really calm at the end of that interaction, what you might find is that the next time people come over, the dog is more frightened. Um, and that's pretty common. And it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive to us. It's sort of the sink or swim mentality that we, some of us, have been raised with. Um, but it actually ends up dropping the dog's confidence and often sensitizing to the exact thing that we wanted to um, change their emotional response to. And so you kind of shoot yourself in the foot. So for flooding and for sensitize, um, for flooding and using what would sort of be um, a sink or swim uh, scenario, the risk is so high that we don't use that with fearful dogs. Uh, so to make things bad, this is an example of how I classically conditioned this little white uh, pity boxer fella to hate his crate. So before I started training, this dog really loved hot dogs and he was terrified of his crate. So he'd had a really bad interaction, he was under socialized, he was a tie out dog um, before, um, and he didn't like his crate at all. So to get him to like it, I went up to the fridge and I got some hot dogs and then I walked over to his crate and what he learned is that when I get hot dogs, it predicts crate training. So that was my training process. Um, and I was planning on it being more like I go to the crate and then he'd be like, oh, crate equals hot dogs. But he saw me get the hot dog. He knew I had hot dogs. And then I went to the crate. And so he made the association, when she gets hot dogs, crate training is going to happen. So what he learned after maybe a couple days is that hot dogs predict fear and he hates hot dogs now. That's what he learned. So he didn't learn to like the crate. It's not just that I had food in the crate and they're out at the same time. He unfortunately learned the wrong association in terms of what I wanted him to learn. He learned that hot dogs predict crates, and so he doesn't like hot dogs. And this fear of hot dogs lasted years. I met him two years later and tried to give him a hot dog, and he spit it out. He did not, he was like, oh, where else hot dogs predict crates for me? Um, some part of his brain remembered that association, and he didn't like hot dogs after that. Remember before that, he loved hot dogs. He had never had any kind of meat treats before, and he was really excited about it. So when that happens, we call that the food was poisoned. What that means is that by doing it maybe over the animal's threshold or doing it in the wrong order, as, as is done here, you can actually train a dog to not like food. Uh, so an example of that for our fearful dogs is pretty common, is that I might have some food in my hand and I'm reaching for the fearful dog and the dog is coming up to get the food, but they don't really like me. Well, over time, the food, the food itself predicts the uncomfortable situation of trying to get the food off my hand. They never liked me. They knew I had food, um, but they have, but they're forced to come close to me to get the food. And they don't want to do that. So um, as part of when you're training these guys is not making them uncomfortable to get the food, but maybe they take a step towards you and you toss the food behind, they can go eat that food comfortably in a safe manner and then choose to take some steps back towards you um, to get more food. And again, it puts them in control. So here's another example. This was a, a maybe like a more semi-feral. He was kind of running loose um, for a while and he uh, was afraid of people. He was afraid of um, men, especially, um, children. He had a little bit better relationship with women. So he had to work a lot on his fear of people. He was very, very fearful of strangers. And his response was to try to run away if he could. He could not run away. Um, just like with any dog, biting is not off the, off the behavior um, repertoire for them. It's a defensive move. So 
before we started his training, he really, 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 he was part lab. He loved hot dogs. He was really scared of people. If he saw somebody, um, even from 100 feet away, he would run to a safe place. He would run to his crate and lay down and try to just avoid them as much as possible. So what we did is we took him out and he saw people at a distance where he was comfortable and he wasn't running away. And as soon as he saw the person, he got to eat a hot dog. So he would start to be look, look for people like it was a video game, looking around trying to find people so he could get hot dogs. And then we could take him into other areas. And you see we start off here in a big field where there's not a lot of people where he can feel safe while I'm training. And then I start to expand his world. He can go to a park. Can he go to a slightly more busy park? Can he go to a park at a time when people are out? And every single person he sees, he gets hot dogs. So actually, I had him for a year. And at the end of the year, he still loved his hot dogs. And he also loved people. He got excited when he saw people. He got excited about people, but he got excited about hot dogs. And really, once they start to be more comfortable with people, and you start to get this, like, oh, I really like people. Now you have a whole nother palette of reinforcers available. People can start, they can play fetch, they can go for walks, they can do other things that kind of strengthen his um, perception of how safe people are. But this very beginning stage, they need these little baby steps to be able to be more comfortable. And he was, he was extremely fearful of strangers and it was full of avoidance or hide. Um, here's, these are those uh, hoarding situations, um, the dogs that were in the very beginning. This is, we went and took, I think, 11 of those dogs off the property. Um, so this is a looking back again, sort of at what sensitization can do. Um, sometimes it's really tempting because you lose your patience and you just want maybe the dog to be able to go outside and walk in the grass. Um, so you quickly put a leash or harness on the dog because you can, let's say they freeze and you can get away with it. The next time you show them the harness, it's a little bit harder. And the next time you go to get the harness, the dog is gone. That's a pretty common example that we find when the dog has been sensitized to the use of some of their walking equipment. Um, and just to remember that overexposure, exploiting them at, at too high of a range will increase their response. So if we went back to the example of boss, if I trained him at a level where he was scared and he wanted to run away, but he couldn't and he was eating hot dogs, I can still sensitize him. He has to be comfortable and feeling safe in order to learn. So, and again, you're gonna see the theme goes through the whole area of how to work with a dog who's more fearful, is that they have to be able to feel safe. Um, so we already quickly looked at sort of flooding in the, um, in the behavior context. It's, it's, a, it's a behavior strategy that's used, as, and we are exposed to it at times too, but it's just when you're thinking about training, remember that it's a lot of stress for the dog. Um, it's dangerous, straight dangerous for dogs who have health issues, if they have heartworm, if they have issues where um, being under a lot of stress can kill them, then flooding, flooding is not physiologically good for the dog. It's really putting them in a situation where they feel like they're drowning and you do it until their body gives up. So physiologically, it's really hard. And then again, on the, the other side, it runs a huge risk of sensitizing them to the entire process. Um, and it can look like magic because in that moment, you have a dog who is super scared and shaking and eventually they stop. Maybe they're walking around interacting with people, but it's this false sense of security because the next time you're on a walk and someone reaches their hand to pet the dog, now the dog might bite, or before it would try to run behind their legs. Um, they learn they can't get away, and it starts to shift some of their behavior strategies. So you just have to be really, really careful with noticing how your dog is feeling about it, um, a situation, and if that dog needs to escape. And to also remember that dogs who were tied out or who are puppy mill dogs, they, far and away, I find they don't actually have the ability to run away. You have to train them to. You have to show them that they can leave. So either putting crate in my crate and they can run to their crate and get food. Um, I can call them away. I make sure I stand really far away so that if I'm their safe person, they can come back to me. Um, that some dogs will investigate further than they're comfortable because they don't know how to escape. They never, tie out dogs don't get to run away. And so they often don't run away. They just stand on the leash wherever they are. And puppy mill dogs can also be really helpless like that too. Sort of um, um, just stand and let everything happen to them, but they look like completely shut down and they're not moving at all. So, um, 
again, this is a little, you can see the kind of worried look on this puppy's face. Comforting and soothing is not going to reinforce fear, but it's important to note that dog has to have a relationship with you. Um, so many feral dogs are not going to want to be pet by someone they don't know. And you're either going to get bit or you're just going to damage the relationship of how those dogs feel about people. Um, facing your phobia or fear has a, a very high risk of damaging it or making it worse. And that was when we were talking about sensitizing. Don't, this is a, a really important aspect to it because one of the things that happens first is you start to realize that dogs like food, they like really high value treats, and we're measuring our success by how close the dog is going to get to me. That's not how I should be measuring success with a fearful dog. What I should be measuring success by is how comfortable is my dog. So I don't want to lure them closer to me. I want that dog eating where they're comfortable, as far away from me as it has to be for the dog to be comfortable. Um, I also don't want to use my body to move the dog because that poisons what, what my body means to the dog. So an example for that is if the dog is not coming inside, but I walk outside to push them in with, with, because they're scared of me, what reinforces I had to push them at a distance that was scary enough to move them inside them and they're afraid to go inside and that damages your relationship. So I really try to find ways to manage so I don't have to do that um, and minimize when I have to do that. Um, and, and I carefully weigh it. It doesn't mean that there are not times when it had to be done, um, but with careful considerations of what the fallout from doing that might be. Um, and always provide an escape. Don't put your dog in a situation where they have to visit strangers, where they have to even interact with you. They should have the ability to go somewhere where they feel safe at all times. So that when they're having an interaction, you really are using it as a training scenario and you're not taking the chance. You're just sensitizing and making the dog more fearful. Um, there are several ways that you can work with fearful dogs. This is actually a video of a coyote. Um, and I'm working on some ways so that I can build that animal's confidence. Building a relationship and building their confidence are two things that can happen at the same time. When you use positive reinforcement training, you're layering the, the experiences that animal has that are successful, and they really will remember who was there when they were successful. So the coyotes, I've never trained the coyotes. I've always trained the handler who works with the coyotes. But the coyotes started to associate me with training just because I was there and began to start to wag his tail and look happy when I showed up. Even though I never directly fed him, he made the association that I was somehow involved in his training. I wasn't just nobody. I was actually a predictor of training. And the training itself was stimulating. It was fun. And he earned food when it was happening. So as an example of how as soon as your dog can eat, I can start working on a relationship. And I can start working on they do some behaviors and they get reinforced for those behaviors. That feels awesome to a fearful dog. It gives them this chance to be in control. So I'm going to show you a behavior that we train this coyote that's also useful because they're doing their nails. Um, let's back to that. So this is her first introduction. She tried to get next to it. She got a little yes for actually scratching it. You can kind of see she's getting excited. She's fearful of new things. See her jump? So these experiences that Piper is having are building her confidence. She did a little scratch. This is also going to help us because we don't have to trim her nails, which was impossible. So she did three scratches and she didn't get reinforced for that one. And so she dropped her, what she was requiring Piper to do to get a treat. And she gave her a treat for one and she gave her a treat for two. You can kind of start to see Piper's body language. She's starting to stand, she's moving more confidently, and she's starting to stand more on her front arms than in her back. Originally, she was moved away from it, like it might be a rattlesnake. Now she's feeling really good about it. I'm like, she's like, I should have got a guess by now. <laughs> and so she's going to pee on it. She went and offered a different behavior than she knows. So some of what you're seeing is that her confidence level is good. <laughs> and she dropped criteria again. She's like, okay, I'm sorry, I asked for too much there. Um, 
So in that little video, you kind of see she was fearful of it. She started to get reports for behaviors around her. She started to realize that she did something to this thing, not this thing's gonna do something to me. And you watch her whole body and how she moves start to change in the environment. That's really some of the foundation of what you do when you're building the confidence in a fearful dog. You're starting to change how they view the world. The world isn't this place that does things to me. I can interact with this world to have outcomes that are favorable. So here is a, a dog from Thailand who's very fearful of handling and mistrustful of food. And they're just working on a target, a simple hand target, where he moves his face to the target to get food. This does a few things. Just by reaching his face towards that hand, he's starting to realize that hands coming towards him are an indication that I can do something for food, not that they're going to pet me or touch me. And that was one of the issues that he had in the house, was um, fearful of hands moving around. So to get him something to do when a hand came out, if a hand comes out and you touch it with your nose, you get a treat, it starts to change how he perceives hands. Hands are not um, kind of these uncontrollable, unpleasant, um, often bringing something negative to my life events, but instead, here's an opportunity for me to win. And that's what you're working on with some of the dogs that are more fearful. If you're working with an X pen, so some of the dogs we've had start off really, really fearful, and you are, it's too scary for them to actually interact with you, so instead you can start off with a pen. They also might not be comfortable touching your hand right away. Sometimes we start off with something a little bit more of a distance. So here is a fox, and he's gonna start off with a target, and he's getting his food with tongs, which also can work for dogs. You can throw it behind him as well. So she just has a golf ball and stick. The fox puts his nose towards the stick, he gets flip, and the click predicts the food. So you could also say yes, or you can just give him the food. Um, and that's just one more way to start to begin the conversation, the training conversation with your animal. Um, if there's a barrier um, and you can't actually go in with them yet. And this can progress to, okay, let's do a shorter and shorter and shorter stick, so let's use my hand to target, um, all depending on how comfortable the animal is and, um, and um, the behaviors you've observed so far in training. So if, you, if you're going to use your hand, what I want to see is I reach my hand towards the animal and it looks relaxed and it's, going, and it's moving its face towards it as if it was a target. That's what you're going for. And you can basically take the stick and you shorten and shorten and shorten so you have just the ball and then you lose the ball and you put your hand up and they go to target your hand and you like that and you feed and then you have an animal who now sees your hands as training um, equipment and not something that's going to grab them. So, that's a little bit about how you start to change their emotional state. Um, the key to that last section is to go slow. You really, if you end up pushing it, thinking that the closer I get, the more progress I'm making, that's really the wrong way to think about it. The way that you want to think about it is, I want this dog to be comfortable and to feel safe. So start there and then broaden the bubble where that works. I just want that, that world to at first be the house for some dogs. Can they be okay in a room? Can they be okay in a house? Can they be okay in the yard? And you just keep expanding what that dog can do and feel okay. So I think in, in a lot of situations when you've adopted, this kind of the last link in the chain is when you've adopted a dog and you find out how fearful they are, Sometimes it takes like a month or two and they start to be comfortable in the house. For other dogs, it's a lifelong struggle. And again, this is something that, um, that we work on with the veterinarian because dogs can have this fear and it can interfere with their quality of life for the, for the rest of their life, the rest of their lifespan. Um, you want to find things that build your relationship, things that the dog and you can do together. And I'm, when I'm speaking about this, I'm going from dogs who you can't touch, dogs that you can touch, but let's say they're three or four strangers in the outside. All of those dogs will have something you can do together. Even the dogs who are really fearful um, and they don't want to be touched, they can tend to, to come out and try to spend time maybe in the living room with you, but, they, but if you stand up, they run away. So they want to be somehow involved, um, and I have to find a way to make that safe for them. Um, it's important when you have these thoughts because it can be so challenging on you emotionally, feeling like you're living with a wild animal, is to chart it. 
um, to chart the ups and also chart down so that I can know what happened. I can be like, well, there was a thunderstorm and then for the next three days, the dog came in the basement. I might be able to ascertain that the dog is afraid of thunderstorms. Um, but I also want to know when did things go well for the dog? Um, maybe I did an interaction and I used boiled chicken for that. And the next time someone came over, the dog came upstairs. I want to record that because it could be that the boiled chicken and the way that I was training was so successful. The dog built that association with just a few repetitions. And so I know I'm on the right track. It's really important to go with the dog's, with the dog's pace. And we've gone over this a few times, but less is more in this scenario. Um, and I'm guilty of it too. There's been times where I really want to just get a harness on an animal. And when it gets the harness on, I'm hoping it just desensitizes that it's going to be a little bit unpleasant, but in the end, it's going to really like it because it gets to go for a walk. Um, don't bank on that because if I push that and spend a long time trying to train just a little past where the dog is comfortable, you can get stuck there for months. You can be in the one spot because I pushed it too far where if I had taken my time and gone maybe three steps back and worked with the dog was really comfortable, then I'll make way more progress. And, and instead of two months in the same spot, in one month now the dog jumps into its harness and goes for a walk. So less is more when you're trying to train a dog who's having an emotional response. Um, it's less than favorable to some of the stuff that we're trying to work on. I think it's really important to find support. There are a lot of people that have dogs like you have. There are a lot of people who are working through issues that are similar um, and to learn from each other, but also just how difficult it can be emotionally. You know, again, we really want to, we want to hug our dogs and we want to be able to pet them and to have your dog fearful of you or not enjoy it can be hard on some people. So kind of realizing what it helps, what, what it takes, what the real rewards are from being able to help a dog like that. Um, to be able to um, to measure things that are that, that maybe we didn't know were important or that are are truly valuable about a relationship that don't involve petting because there's a lot of very special things you can do and a real connection you can have with the dog who honestly doesn't like to be pet. Um, it's it's sort of that's one of our ideas, but some of those dogs are able to show you there's a bigger world out there besides physical contact that is a relationship and it's still super special and unique. So this is to look at some of the things that you can do to start to build that dog's confidence. And again, there are some dogs that don't like to be pet. Um, they might really start to enjoy some of these, in, these kind of interactions with you um, and they work with you while you're doing it. So pros and cons, cardboard boxes are um, uh, boxes that whatever leftover boxes of any sort you can have newspaper you wrap up treats you put those in the boxes some of the dogs that are really like the puppy mill dogs might be really afraid to experiment with that originally um some of the, the dogs i've had who are street dogs or who are feral they know exactly what they're doing when they see cardboard boxes with food in it what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to raise the dog's confidence and their confidence around me by giving them something to do they can be successful so it doesn't matter what you do really, it's that they do a behavior and that they're successful. They find out that when they interact with this world, good things happen. So toys and novel objects, I might try to put like plastic cups in the living room and when they come out and they touch the plastic cup, um, I can toss food for them or I hide from under the plastic cup. Just trying to give them things they can find in the environment that they're, they're winning. It's like I'm trying to make a video game with, with a lot of wins for them in this world. So um, fabric, for some of the dogs who are afraid of tear, torn paper, you can take a fabric and you roll it up and you put treats in it like a, um, like a little burrito and you can give that to them. If they get really good with that, you can slightly wet that and freeze it and give it to them and they have to open up that. Um, and sometimes there are dogs who I've started off with, they're so afraid of interacting with anything. I just take really high value of something like meat or cheese and you put a blanket almost on top of it but not all the way so they just have to move a little corner of it and they can get the food out and then you can start to evolve that into slightly more difficult slightly more challenging but always ends in success is the key um for some dogs sniff walks can be great for other dogs walks are just completely off the menu those dogs to them it's a nightmare it's like a war zone they don't need to go out for other dogs some of the feral dogs um it's great they really like it um it can be a really great thing to do to build your relationship the key to this is that the dog is going to show you the things that it likes and that are going to be valuable. 
and it's not a benefit for us to force a dog on a sniff walk because it's not going to do what we want it to. It's not going to help us in the way we want it to. Um, and of course, pods of reinforcement training. So helping the dog learn skills that it might need to, um, to navigate a world. Some of those things that we already talked about are things like if they're really scared to be able to run in their crate and get food, um, to hand target people's hands, um, to be able to put their own leash on. So you can train a dog to, if I have a clip, they can walk into it. They target their neck into the leash and I can clip it and then we can move around. All of that can be trained um, uh, and it can be a part of their confidence building if I do it really carefully. Um, this is a little puppy, another puppy from a puppy mill. This dog was not eating any food and would not move or get off the mat. And so I put in a ball with food in it which is just an example of some enrichment. And within five minutes, the dog was moving. And, and really what you're trying to do for this, for these dogs, like and this is a dog in a shelter situation, but this can also be once this dog goes home. I want this dog to start moving. I want them to start doing things. I want to see lots of behaviors a healthy animal has a healthy, wide variety of behaviors they can offer in a given moment. Um, and we can see a lot of different things going on here. And the dog is, for the first time, his tail's up, they're more relaxed, they're paying attention to something else. Um, this was kind of the beginning for this dog to open up. Before this, this dog was curled up in a tight little ball um, in the corner um, for days. And after the dog started to use enrichment on a regular basis, you started seeing happier and happier. And then who predicts the enrichment but the people? So we're not just bringing food, we're bringing these toys and this fun stuff. So we start to represent something really good too. And actually for this video, I stepped out of the room because if I was in the room, it would be too stressful for the dog and it wouldn't have been able to play. It was enough that I brought the thing and then I left for the dog to make the association. So just to recap, um, how we identify the high-risk dogs, looking at their body language, how fast they recover from a stressful situation. Um, are they fearful of one thing, or do you have something more like a general anxiety where they're always on edge, they always seem to be under stress, and there is no specific location for that anxiety. I can't figure out exactly what it is, but they're waiting always for the other shoe to kind of fall. Um, or you have on the other side, they're fearful, but they know what it is, and they try to escape, or they try to do something about their fear. Connect with a veterinary professional. So remember that just like with people, extreme trauma and fear and um, the, the thing that so many, really too many of our dogs are subjected to um, is a lifelong condition for a lot of dogs. And it can have an incredible impact for that dog to have a veterinarian um, on their side when it comes to that type of fear. The make their home a safe place. Make sure that when where they have somewhere that they can go where they can decompress because if they don't feel safe, then they're not going to be able to learn the association. Try to give them lots of choices and space. I remember at one point here I said that if a dog was sleeping on the couch, I walk around them. What I don't want is for that dog to see me and then startle suddenly um, because I just approached it. And I might even say something let them know I'm not going to interact before I walk towards them. Like, I'm going to get up now and then stand up from the chair so they have a transition. They know and can predict a little bit more about the future. And this really depends on your specific dog. We can't go into specifics because it's just a wide range of the dogs that we kind of cap under when we say a fearful dog. Um, but each dog is going to have things you can do to make their life a little bit more predictable, a little bit safer. Um, giving them as many choices for things as possible helps build that confidence at home. I want to use positive um, reinforcement at home. Uh, there's no reason to say no or push a dog off something or punish a dog for a behavior. We are trying in every way possible in the opposite direction. I want that dog to learn that everything that it's doing is successful and then I just try to manage and train the behaviors I want to be successful. So if I want the dog to be able to greet people, I need to be comfortable first when, it, when it's going up to see people. If my fearful dog jumps on somebody, I would never say no. I would call the dog back to me. I would just be like, here, and he comes down and he gets a treat for coming back. Um, if I end up, if I said no because he jumped on somebody, then he just got a negative interaction for interacting with somebody. And that, again, is 
they're so sensitive to bad experiences, especially on things they're already afraid of, that I'm not worried about them jumping. All I care is that they're happy around people, and then you can train whatever you want on top of that. Um, build their confidence, use some of the enrichment, some of the ideas that we talked about. There's so many games that are available for dogs that are fearful um, to start to build their confidence in the house. They're fun for both of you. They should be something that while the dog is doing, they're having a good time and they're really engaged. Um, find out what the things they are afraid of are and start to change their emotional response in a very careful, graded way. And I usually choose things that are the most important um, for you and the dog. So, for example, my first thing is dog is safe in the house. Your next thing was they like everyone in the house. Those are, if you can have a dog who likes everyone in the house and they're safe in the house, now I can start to maybe bring in other people or get them to go outside. But your first goal is that they, they have a relationship with everybody in the house and that they feel safe there. And then you can start to branch out um, and, build, and help them build a template for how you get to greet people and how we do that kind of thing. Um, and travel at your dog's pace. So it isn't a race. It isn't, you're like, all right, I have to be somewhere in one month. Your goal is that your dog is comfortable where you are, and then you can take the next steps, kind of to push that dog um, to a place where you know they're going to be successful. And that's a part of trust, too, is when I ask them to train with me, I'm not going to let them down. I want the dogs to know that I'm going to set you up for things that you will always be successful um, when you're working with me.